So a very well welcome, uh, Rinpoche, from all of us. And um, heartfelt gratitude for your visit here to Larabling today. Um, you have been here before a few times to teach, uh, in 1993, 1996. And of course, you consecrated um, the stupa, um, Kandro Tsering Chujun's stupa. So I have to wait for the French translation. Um, and so we're really, really grateful that you're coming at this difficult time for us to uh, help clarify some of the misunderstandings that we all have on Vajrayana Buddhism. So I think I was going to introduce you to all the different guests that uh, were coming today, but I actually what I need to say first is that most of them have not actually been able to make it. So that's obviously really unfortunate. We'd invited um, journalists, we'd invited uh, Le Père Lucas from the, uh, the Interfaith Diocese of Montpellier was going to come, uh, and the president of Ladfi in Montpellier also, but n none of them have been able to come because all the roads are closed. And also several representatives from other Buddhist organizations have also actually had to turn back because their buses were getting stuck in the snow. So, as you know, we will put this out on YouTube so they will all be able to watch tomorrow. So... So, uh, thank you very much, Rinpoche, and we're really looking forward to your uh, talk today on whether Vajrayana Buddhism is a cult. So, first of all, I'd like to express my um, joy for coming here and have this opportunity. I'd like to um, say that um, I'm here to try to answer some questions and clarify some of the fundamental Vajrayana teachings that seems to have some misinterpretation. Um, I'm not here to be sort of um, 
pro or against Rigpa or Sogajan Bhutin. Because um, Buddha Dharma in general and Vajrayana Buddhism is much more important than Rigpa or Sogajan Bhutin. I feel that Buddha Dharma and Vajrayana still can do a lot, contribute a lot to people in general, especially the modern people and especially the West. Sometimes I even joke saying that Vajrayana Buddhism is almost like a custom made for Westerner and especially modern Westerner. Because it is based on critical thinking analytical thinking and it is not really dogmatic I, I don't know sometimes I think that you will never find a path or a system that is so undogmatic than the Mahayana or the Vajrayana. Of course, to understand that is going to take some time. You have to have patience, you have to put some effort in studying this and not only study but practice. Then also, obviously, you must know there is the path or the system, and then there is the person that dwells on the path or the system, Buddha Dharma and the Buddhist. Th these two are two different things. Buddhists are not always perfect. <laughs> but many times, and understandably, the system or the path, Buddha Dharma, gets valued and judged just because of uh, behavior or a manifestation of a Buddhist or a person. Now, <clears throat> there are, there, there's so many questions and I will try to answer m most of these questions um, through, as I go through some of the main uh, points that uh, we have decided to touch this time.
Now the first thing is, is Vajrayana Buddhism a cult or a religion? Cult is kind of a new term for me. And uh, it is a term I should teach to my fellow teachers back home in India that there is something called cult, by the way. So I went through the some dictionaries like Oxford and uh, Webster dictionaries, what cult is. Which I'm sure you can find out yourself. And my conclusion is Vajrayana and Buddhism all together don't really fit either definition. First of all, so many of these terms are new. For instance, do you know that the word Hinduism never existed before Abrahamic people invented? In entire, when we study philosophy, in entire text, we never have a word Hinduism. It's a word created by Christians, Muslims, you know, anything that is beyond Sindhu River. You know the river Sindhu, long time ago? Anything that belongs to the religion uh, that is beyond the Sindhu River is put it all together as a Hindus. And somehow Buddhism got into it inside there. So, Tawa Tamje Pangbichir Gotam Tela Chasalo, there is a. I don't. Have, if you have ever received teachings from Dalai Lama, often he, he recited these verses just before he teach. And what it really meant, it was composed by a great Nagarjuna that that stanza is a praise to the Buddha. And in that stanza, what Nagarjuna is saying is, to the Buddha, we offer our veneration, one who has abandon all the view, all th theory, all thesis. Again and again we have heard in the Buddhist teachings Like a boat, if you go to the other shore, once you reach the other shore, you don't want to stand still in the, you still st don't want to be sort of sitting in the boat because then you are not on the other shore. Once you reach the other shore, 
you naturally abandon the boat. Likewise, the trash, the garbage, the last trash or the garbage that the Buddhists have to abandon is Buddhism. And this is more so with the Vajrayana than even other Buddhist path. For instance, Vajrayana's most important practice is called Guru Yoga. The quintessence of the Guru Yoga practice is towards the end of the Guru Yoga, Guru dissolves into you and you become inseparable with the Guru. That is the abandoning of the system of the Guru. Having said all of this, I understand there is a really, I understand why, you know, bystanders, any, anyone who walk in will think Buddhism is a religion, it is a cult, especially Vajrayana. I totally understand they will think that. <laughs> Anyone who walk into this house will think this is a really a cult group. Any all these, you know, human photos up there, those are those are not going to go well with people who are very critical about cult stuff. You know, Buddhism, until the, I think the King Ashoka's time, I think even during the King Ashoka's time, the Buddhists ne really did not have statue of the Buddha. Instead, they have some other representative, such as there's a long bed. Under um, next to this bed is two trees. You know, in the carvings you can see it. That represents the Parinirvana of the Buddha. And then there's a, a throne, a small throne, and next to the throne is a deer and a, this will, this sort of a, it's called Dharma Chakra, Dharma will, which represents the teaching, the sort of the Buddha's uh, teaching, you know. Uh, but the throne is empty. Then there is a throne, and behind the throne is a big um, tree, body tree, which of course represents the enlightenment. 
This is, we are talking about something like 400 years later, you know, still. There, no, there was no much practice of using the image. Image of the Buddha, I mean. But they still use the image, you know, the thrones and all that. As the time goes, you know, people have less time. They need more vivid image, I guess. So the statues get more and more elaborated. But, um, well, anyway, that, that's one, one of the historical account, one version. There's a many different versions. So there is a lot of this kind of a representation and symbolic, which is also very much intertwined with the culture of that country, wherever it happened to be. So things like this big box behind me, it doesn't go very well if you try to prove that this is not a cult. <laughs> you know, somebody sitting there and then the trumpet and all the Tibetan paraphernalia. Um, but unfortunately, instead, okay, unfortunately, these symbolisms, these rituals, Thrones, photographs, trumpets, I don't know. Those things usually ends up hijacking for noble truth, for seal, shunyata, bodhicitta, etc. <laughs> And this has been a big downfall. very much with the Tibetan Buddhism and I'm afraid with other Buddhist tradition also. Especially when this, this wisdom gets taught in totally different parts of the world, like France. And not only the outer, what do you call it, outer symbolism and outer ritual, but inner Tibetan culture, Eastern culture, habit, that also gets in between the Dharma and also the uh, you know, with a, with a person, with the people who are trying to follow. Um,
For instance, I have seen with my own eyes many Western students coming to the Eastern teacher and talk about their guilt. And then the Eastern teacher will say, oh, that's so good. Guilt is a good thing. If you don't have a guilt, you have a no base of spiritual path. So they, I find there is a total, what do you call it, miscommunication. I guess this is going to take some time and we let's remember, let's keep in mind this has only been what, less than 100 years that Buddhism actually started to take root in the West. So I think we have to be a little bit patient. Also, to be fair with all the symbols and the cultures that I was talking about, now there are a lot of new spiritual sort of path, system. They use a lot of Buddhist method, a lot of Buddhist wisdom. They, I don't know, probably with a good intention, but probably also for a better marketing. They try to hide the Buddhist jargon. They get rid of a lot of the essential Buddhist things. This also is happening and more and more it's, pr it's growing. So I sometimes worry between Tibetan lamas insisting on all this Tibetan paraphernalia and very ambitious, very good at packaging Western new meditation instructor, teachers, app makers, uh, in quasi sort of, what do you call it, um, secular Buddhist in uh, disguise, uh, really losing the quintessential Buddhist path, somehow we will miss we will lose the wisdom of Buddha totally, and that will be very, very bad. Now, specifically, when we talk about cult, religion, and Vajrayana, especially in the Vajrayana, there's, there's something that we need to be aware of. And that is, Vajrayana talks about Guru as the most important yoga. Um, 
And this is where I think the Vajrayana student and the practitioner, we have to be really be aware, be educated, be well informed about the, Vaj the Vajrayana Guru principle. First, this guru business, the whole Vajrayana guru business, should have never been in you know in the public arena. I'm talking about the Vajrayana Guru. You know, Guru in Hindi or in Sanskrit means teacher, you know. <coughs> Any other teachers, it doesn't matter, but the Vajrayana Master, Vajrayana Guru, it should be kept secret. Le, le guru, guru, en, en Actually, not only Vaj Guru, everything about the Vajrayana should have been should have been kept secret. It's found in every text. A Vajrayana practitioner must outwardly, outwardly he must he or she must practice as a Sharvakayana person. Innerly. He or she must practice like a Mahayana person, only secretly, as a Vajrayana practitioner. You know who is the culprit who ruined this path? Sorry to say, but Tibetans. In India, the tantric practitioners didn't do this way. They kept it very quiet. They kept it quiet, not because Vajrayana has a something very fishy and strange thing, and something embarrassing. They kept it because Vajrayana wisdom is so profound, and if it is, you know, in the hand of a someone who is not prepared, it can really ruin themselves and others. At the moment, the Guru is the hot topic, I know. But let's choose one single method of Vajrayana. Emotion as the path. See, if you, you can mishandle this statement, emotion as the path. If you don't know how to keep that, that could get really misused. Oh, so much. And it has been in the past and individually, many times.
many many vajrayana so called vajrayana people practitioners they misbehave they do crazy things in pretext that they are practicing vajrayana this wisdom of using uh, emotion as the path makes their emotion even more wild would it been much better to suppress the emotion uh, even though that is not advice i mean even in the mundane world isn't it but the statement like use you know emotion as the path gets misused and so many other symbols such as the tantric deities nowadays you can just click on google and you can have a picture of a kala chakra or chakra sambara many lamas very high lamas gave initiations of the chakra sambara with a big picture of chakra sambara or kala chakra behind them they should be careful a very smart lawyer can always find a way to say this is a pornography there are children here under age people and how about the skulls skull crown and all of that it should never have been in the public <coughs> but what to do it's too late i said no this just came in my mind so i'll just say it you know tiger's nest in bhutan there's a place called tiger's nest and i was doing a retreat there inside the tiger's nest but somehow the rule is that every nobody is uh, you know any visitors to the cave cannot be barred you know you can do retreat but you know visitors must be allowed so what i did was i had a curtain made so no one would see me but the visitors come and go and every day so many tourists come and go and then many times tourist guides i know what they are saying <laughs> there's a guru rinpoche statue that sit, that stands on the tiger and the guide must be pointing to the guru rinpoche saying this is guru rinpoche this is the most precious lama in bhutan and 
I think he must be pointing at the tiger. This is his wife. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, there's, you know, so I can, you know, one time I'm, I hear, you know, this American tourist, oh, you know, like they are making, and I'm thinking, oh my God. Putinists must be really like following a path that promotes bestiality. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, the culp real culprit is the Tibetans. It's sort of understandable in Tibet when everywhere, basically, you know, before 1950s, Tibet was sort of closed. Nobody was allowed to go in. So in there, sort of everybody is kind of following the Mahayana or, De or Vajrayana. So it was not an issue before. But they should know better. The time and place has changed. Anywhere outside of Tibet is different. Have you seen a movie called Party? Peter Sellers? You can't show this anymore. It will be a so, uh, there will be uproar, racial problem. You know, this, you know, the Indians are made, f you know, fun of Indians there. So, it's a, it's, it's a, okay. So this is a pity when now, when the Tibetan Buddhism is c coming to the West, as I said earlier, the West, who would really appreciate the wisdom of the Vajrayana should have been promoted. But instead, it got hijacked by other stuff. And this is why guru, guru devotion, obedience to the guru, seeing whatever guru does is everything perfect. All of that gets hijacked in, in you know, like a cultural thing, Eastern thing, and, you know, cult thing. <laughs> Since we are here talking about the Guru, before I, you know, I don't, you know, my thread of my, whatever I'm talking is not, not so good, so you have to, you know, excuse me for this one. So while I remember, I will talk to you a little bit about Guru and Guru Yoga. Buddha said, never depend on person, but depend on the teaching. He said, you are your own master, nobody is. Guru Yoga, the Guru principle of the Tantra, does not contradict this at all.
when we talk about the guru in the vajrayana we are talk we talk about guru um, outer inner and the secret guru what does guru do anyway fundamentally one that leads you that is one that leads leading and who else can lead you only your inner and secret guru so your own nature your own absolute nature is the inner and the secret guru and by the way there's so much teachings on that and then you have that this is your nature temporarily you are covered by all kinds of defilements but your true nature is that guru if your true nature is not this guru no matter what you do you can never become perfect and i'm always i always use this example if the cup that i'm holding if it is stained with lots of dirt i'm not that worried because i know i can wash it because if you don't know this is washable then you are doomed the fact that the dirt is removable it's temporary le fait que la sagesse on peut l'enlever elle est temporaire elle est pas le fait que la saleté est temporaire et qu'on peut l'enlever the the actually the cup is spotless it's clean primordially pure inherently pure and this you don't have to download this you have it and it's so close you have it all the time even when you are sleeping you have it this need to be actualized and for that we need the outer guru so that so so the outer guru's function is to tell you this inner and secret guru in many many ways so as i said earlier even in the guru yoga at the end you dissolve the outer guru in you dissolve i mean not inside you you know you you become inseparable with the outer guru okay that is sort of more or less one of one aspect one important aspect of the guru yoga now you have the right to choose this outer guru and every tantric text tells you to choose it carefully and put lot of thoughts before you choose this If 
if you are especially if you are critically minded oh yes you really better analyze this thoroughly you have it is you you have the choice and if you choose to have that as you are vajrayana master it is your personal choice once you choose then that is the path that you are trying to follow then obviously you have to have the discipline to stick with it otherwise what's the point and so this is a sort of a you know i i guess we can if we have time later we can talk about this more during the question and answer if you are not satisfied <coughs> so you know the vajrayana is important for me so this is why i'm i you know this p- a few months i put try to put some effort in trying to see what is it that's really getting misunderstood Okay. So, as I go through this, I found this one. This is somebody, you know, a solution to Tibetan Buddhism's totalitarian structure and the master-slave relations embedded in its feudal history. I think the writer is called Thalia Newland. I think the suggestion is I think this is I'm trying to quote from her Institute a democratic model where the lama is employed by the board and remove the obey or else emphasis that some lamas subscribe to and the issue is solved okay <coughs> Basically you know democratically yeah And then also she says the lama will have spiritual authority but not temporal authority. Okay. Democratic model where the lama is employed. Really? Do you really want that? You already have the Trump. If you do that you may have me much worse. <laughs> you know my zodiac sign is Gemini. Gemini's ability is they have the ability to sell ice cube to Eskimos. if you if there is a board of direct a board of i don't know guild or a board or a some sort of a structure where guru gets elected or i will i will win easily <laughs> and i will also try to raise some funds and you know easy easy
I don't know whether this is a good idea, but this is something that we can think of. <laughs> and moreover, I have read, you know, majority ruling, right? Democracy is a majority ruling, which means, what do you call it? Common denomination? What, what? Co common de common denominate? <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> but where she talks about having spiritual authority and temporal, you know, not temporal authority, I have a little sympathy towards that comment. Although Theoretically, a lama can be a king, the leader, secular, whatever leader, temporal le leader, and spiritual, uh, your guru, your root guru. But in practice, I think it is so difficult. <clears throat> because, and this is again, yet again, in Tibet, this become a big fault. When the lamas ended up becoming a political leader, it really ruined the Tibetan Buddhism in general, especially Vajrayana. And as I was saying earlier, even when like places like Bhutan or Nepal or Tibet, even if there is a function such as a opening ceremony of a post office, lamas get invited and they give an initiation as part of the opening ceremony. And if it is a very, very high lama, and if you also happen to be sort of, you know, socially known person, it's very awkward to just stand up from there and say, hey, I'm not receiving the initiation, I will join you later. You can't really do that. And I will tell you very honestly, I have met people who had to do that, and they said they just block their ears and they receive. I mean, I really feel for them. That at least means that they know the consequences. So they at least try to block their ears and try to concentrate on other things. And of course, their body is, you know, like this. You know, like trying to, trying to pretend that they are very devoted, but they are actually not really receiving it. That's about the best thing you could do. <laughs> and this is a. <coughs> teachings that were given by our forefather, the Indians. You know how did they do? They went inside a cemetery or a mountain top or a deep in the forest in the middle of no nowhere, in the middle of the night, and nobody looking at you, guru, and a st one guru, one student, no trumpets, no loudspeakers, no, you know, uh, live stream, <laughs> they, they receive the tantric blessings and t teachings. 
souvent expliquer ce qui nous rend heureux. En face, nous allons dans les cimetières, dans les forêts, en haut d'une montagne, au milieu de nulle part, au milieu de la nuit, et c'est un jour ou l'autre, en nous disant il n'y avait pas de trompette, il n'y avait pas de, de micro, il n'y avait pas non plus de, comment de diffusion directe, de streaming, et rien ne préférait les renseignements de Dieu. And then, also, there seems to be a lot of suggestion that once you chose soberly, consciously, after analysis, you receive the Vajrayana initiation of the highest, you still have chance and you can still criticize, abandon, slander the guru. There seems to be um, you know, people who wish to have that. I, under, I have a sympathy that there is a, some sort of a good motivation there. You know, you want to have a check and balance. But this is, <clears throat> after you receive the highest initiation and after you consciously chose that path, according to the, the, the Vajrayana, the tantric principle, you cannot go against the, uh, against the guru. That is the, you know, tantric principle. Okay, let's say you can do it. For how long? You will always have some sort of a dualistic and you know negative thinking. You know, be a sentient being. So you end up, you know, finding faults in the guru again and again, and you try to sort of correct that again and again, and you will have a different, you know, new projection again and again. So the whole principle of the guru devotion is collapsed. And by the way, please remember, you don't have to choose this path. There is 83,999 other menu. List is very long. This happened to be really compact, easy, you know, 
very much cherished by many, many great practitioners of the past. But then there are other, probably more secure, more, what do you call it, safe, if you want to put it, not too volatile path that you can choose. You, you have a total right to choose. And also, I'm a little bit surprised that everybody is hang, uh, you know, stuck with this principle called uh, this idea of guru devotion. There is the other thing, completely important too. How about the student devotion? Letting a guru, letting a student enter into the mandala, this highest mandala, and giving the initiation, that is one of the most dangerous and the most vicarious thing to do for the guru. I think Matthew Ricard wrote something about this. He said, once disciples are absolutely certain after carefully examining the spiritual master that he or she is perfectly authentic, they must, if they wish to progress on the path, of offer an implicit trust beyond skepticism and doubt, just as climbers scaling a steep cliff face must trust their guide without questioning each and every instruction. I'm quoting a French person, by the way. And he, he, you know, he was a scientist, and he's a philosopher's, uh, philosopher's son. Yes. So if you, so as I already said, you know, let's say you can be critical, for how long? You know, does it make sense? Because, you know, our, ne our defiled judgment is endless. The only being that we can be together and keep on having not really pure perception but sort of a loving and affection is dogs i think <laughs> like animals two human beings together more than two weeks <laughs> you will find fault And also, I don't really understand why, you know, some people are going so crazy about this, you know, oh, you know, total obedience, total pure perception, total, you know, non-critical towards Guru. This is like so archaic, this is so outdated, this is so primitive. I don't understand why they go on like that. Oh, 
Okay, let's not practice Vajrayana. Let's practice Mahayana. Shall we? Let's practice compassion. Now let's choose not all sentient beings. Let's choose one. You, you are supposed to have compassion to this person, no matter what this person does. You can't say that one day, you know, this pers person is a little bit strange. Oh, no, no. Today you are not an object of my compassion. You can't do that. Uh, unconditionally, you are supposed to have a compassion towards all sentient beings. Can you do that? Okay. So let's not. You Okay. Now, Mahayana is also not for us. Let's get rid of that. <laughs> Let's jump into Sharvakayana. Renunciation mind. Oh. <laughs> can, we, can we have renunciation minds towards everything? Okay, let's choose one. And this leads directly to Again, I think it is Miss Newland's, you know, comment. I think she says something like, some lamas do place Vajrayana above the law, and this belief that Vajrayana has its own rules separate to the rule of law is the single most dangerous aspect of Vajrayana for both students and the society. I'm, s I'm sorry to say, not only Vajrayana, whole Buddha Dharma is above the law. <laughs> if, you, if you want to pit, put one feet firmly grounded on the samsara and, and have the little advantage of the nirvana, I would suggest you to download you know, mindfulness apps. <laughs> don't become, don't follow Buddha. It's, it's it really, it's, it's, it's a bad news. <laughs> but I actually don't understand why there's this question, because even people like Martin Luther King, Human law that is not rooted in the inter, uh, eternal law and natural law. You know, he believed there's a law beyond human law. And I'm talking about Martin Luther King. Should we take a break? Yes.
I have to be careful here making too many jokes. <laughs> because, um, you know, wow, the way the people interpret, misinterpret. And I think it's, isn't there something called a Q, Q, right? It's called Q, right? C-U-E, Q, cultural Q, Qs, Qs. Dizantis, Andis, okay. And I guess so much, you know, misinterpretation in all of this. And, um, you know, <coughs> people, you know, people will, uh, people have already said that I have no sympathy towards these alleged victims. Um, if what, what is, you know, what they're saying is true, and if this is what has happened, and if there's no preparation, no proper understanding uh, between, you know, uh, the Lama and the student, I have uh, so much sympathy. And my sympathy is not just for their, you know, sort of emotional, physical, you know, psychological hurt. It goes beyond that. It's the seed of bodhicitta, devotion to the Buddha Dharma. That, that's even more important. And that is something that I and men, all of us fellow Vajrayana students, followers, since they are all our Vajra brothers and sisters, we need to really care for it. And what I'm trying to do is also trying to really clarify Vajri Tantric, you know, sort of principles. And hopefully, this could also clarify the further misunderstandings. I think there is a also, okay, so there's this question about whether Vajrayana demand complete obedience. Nowhere in the Vajrayana text talks about um, how if somebody just walk in to a tantric master, the master will demand complete obedience. That's, that's, that's so stupid. Also, not skillful. You know, nowhere in the Vajrayana there is a mention that a guru can do what they like. Yeah, 
In fact, the opposite. As I said earlier, one student, one more student is a really a big burden for those who are really a genuine guru. They, you know, for, for the guru, student is more important than his or her own child. So there's never a mention about guru can do what they like. You know, these things need to be sort of explained. I mean, we need to differentiate these things. There's no mentioning of, you know, guru can do what they like. There is mention of student once chosen him and her as a guru must try to see whatever he or she does as enlightened activities. You know, there's a two difference here. There's no mention about guru can do whatever they like. Okay. As a, there's a mention about the student's job is to see whatever he does as perfect. That's your choice. That's your choice. That's your choice. I'm trying to just just so that you know I don't get misquoted again. I'm trying to sort of repeat this. Okay, I am a good example. I have some of the most wonderful guru, I think. More and more, as I get old, I, wow. This is one merit I have. Most of them have passed away. There's one still living, Jabji Sakit is in Rinpoche. Will I be able to do whatever they say? No. Um, do I have a perfect, you know, pure perception towards them? No. But will I try my best to see them as perfect and do, you know, like try to, you know, do whatever they demand, whatever they ask? Will I try? Yes, I will try. And many, many of them I know I will not be able to do, but I will have aspiration that if not this life, in next life I'll be able to do this. If Jabji Sagi Trizin Rinpoche told me, okay, from today you will, you know, stop doing uh, Guru Rinpoche prayer, but instead you pray to Donald Trump, I will do it. This one I will do it. This one I will do it. If Sagittarius and Bhutia said, okay, you missed the next uh, Il Clasico, you know, Real Madrid and uh, Barcelona match, I will swallow one saliva and then say yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
And most importantly, listen to this, most importantly, in my mind, I have this, oh, Sakichizin or Dingochenzi Rinpoche or Dujom Rinpoche will never tell me to jump off the building. I will, um, you know, I will think like this. They will never tell me that. And today I will do prayer that may I never have this kind of precondition. That's already creating a condition, you know. Or he, you know, it's like oh, I don't think he will do. He will do this to me. He will no, you know. If you want to practice the tantra, this is yes. This is the tantric way, and that's uh, m your choice. And you can call me blind, you can call me, you know, sort of. I don't know, like backward, primitive, but for me, having met someone like Dujum Rinpoche, Tinkuchen Rinpoche, Sakitiz Rinpoche, to me, because, you know, I look at my life and I'm very lazy and I don't practice. I don't really do a lot of Dharma activities, you know, Dharma practice. I don't go to retreat as much as I should. But, you know, deep somewhere, I'm kind of happy because just having met them, to me, I will be all right. If not this life, next life. If not next life, next after next life. And to me, that, that comfort is good. But as I said, you can call me blind. I want to emphasize here, nowhere in the Vajrayana text that mentions as soon as you walk into the Vajrayana temple or a Vajrayana setting and you just, you know, you uh, become his student or he is allowed to demand, no, no mentioning of that. If you find a text that says something like this, I want to bet you will not find, and if you find one, I will miss few matches. Okay, so next one, how can we reconcile Western values of independence, free will, critical intelligence, transparency with the core Vajrayana principle of devotion, loyalty, secrecy, and surrender? We will try to cover that. It's really, really big.
Here I want to talk about this term paradox. You know, one of my Indian friends, recently we had, you know, we had a chat. I think in Indian, you know, in Hindi, the word paradox, it, uh, paradox means the illusion of oppositeness. And in Sanskrit, I think it's defined as the illusion that something is not true. And we were, you know, we were talking about whether Western society appreciates paradox in its full, what do you call it, full scale. What is paradox in French? Paradox? What does it mean? It seems to be contradictory, but it's not. Hmm. The reason why I want to bring up this paradox Is because you know they hear that subject is recon how how we can reconcile Western values and you know the Vajrayana principle. So that's where we are getting at. You can almost say that Buddhism, generally many of the Indian wisdom, especially Buddhism, ha has a, such an amazing teachings, method, technique to really understand what is paradox and how to really apply that into day-to-day -day life. In fact, when we talk about paradox, usually we talk about two things, right? Two things. But in Buddhism, especially in Mahayana, like a Heart Sutra, we talk about four things. Form is emptiness, emptiness is not form. About, remember, emptiness is form, you know? Basically, Um, it's there, but it's not there. Rainbow is beautiful, let's take a selfie. <laughs> but let's not go too close, because then you will not see it. Or, Every day, past 56 years, I go to bathroom and see my face in the mirror. Unfailingly. Not even once it became a baboon with a banana. None. <laughs> but, doesn't mean that somebody is there. This is how it is with everything that we have. Democracy. Eastern value, Western value, gender, what else? Everything, everything. Critical thinking, blind thinking, color, shape, art, music, Everything is paradox. And when you don't know the essence of the paradox, you suffer. Try to put lipstick on the lips of that thing in the mirror. 
you will suffer. Go close to with a chainsaw to cut the rainbow, you will suffer. If you know how to enjoy, it's there, but it's not there, like watching a film. Beautiful, suspenseful, romantic, beautiful shots, whatever film, but if the bladder is full, pause it and go to the toilet and come back. <laughs> this is liberation. And nowhere else, nowhere else, but in the Vajrayana, this path to appreciate the paradox is taught completely in its full length and painlessly. Really? Don't miss out on Vajrayana. It is just so beautiful. It is a one part. You can look at a glass of water thinking, my glass is full of dakini. We talk about Western value of in independence, free will. You will have more of that if you can appreciate paradox. So even with this, <clears throat> but briefly, I want to talk about this, what um, independence, free will, critical intelligence, etc. Study, analyze, be critical, be logical. <coughs> Never rely on the person, but on the teaching. You are your own master. Everything is dependent on cause and conditions. Not an o not to an almighty creator. This should, if this is not compatible with the Western value of but independence and free will and critical intelligence, then nothing can. And Vajrayana um, while Vajrayana Buddhism is so compatible with all these values, Vajrayana can do something extra which is keeping the wisdom 
above all these methods. And that's, that's a very, very important, what do you call it? Uh, that's, that's, that's something important that you need to make note of. Um, not only, actually, this is not only Vajrayana, even in the Mahayana, wisdom is, um, uh, you know, above all the methods. I want to give you an example. How does, okay, for instance, like a psychiatrist, when you are working with your patient, If you don't have the wisdom of non-duality, then what happens is you are stuck with the duality of what we think, what is normal and what is not normal. And then, oftentimes, we try to impose our n normality to someone else. And this is where the wisdom of non-duality, if you have that wisdom of non-duality, uh, non you are not stuck with the idea of what is normal and what is not normal. So for this reason, in Buddhism, there is so many, many methods and especially in the Vajrayana, there's nothing that cannot be a method. As long as you can apply the wisdom, every action, any action can be transformed into the method. And this is where all the things that I was talking earlier, sort of seemingly ritual, ritualistic, seemingly cultural oriented, like offering incense, offering flower, sand mandala, Zen garden, oroyoki, sitting straight, all of this comes in. As long as there is a wisdom, all of this works. All of these are path to the liberation. If the wisdom is none. If, if, if there is no wisdom, none of this really can liberate you. Uh, 
I'll try to wrap this up and then we'll go to the question and answer. Um, I, w I always get carried away and ended up talking s too much. But there's one thing. Um, I think we I think we we talked about the principle of devotion, loyalty, secrecy, and surrender. Somewhat, but I'll just say just just one more t uh, one more clarification. Just very brief, brief, briefly. Devotion is in the uh, you know in the general Buddhist uh, teachings. Devotion is defined as um, trusting cause, condition, and if there is no obstacle, a result is guaranteed. Understanding that is the devotion. So we are talking about a very general devotion. Now, there is irrational devotion which we need to avoid without any analysis, without any soberly thinking, completely jumping into a path out of just because of your, I don't know, biased mind or whatever. That's irrational devotion. We need to avoid that. <coughs> we need to use rational devotion, which we have just talked about, basically trusting cause, condition, and effect. But in the Vajrayana, devotion is much more. Devotion is to go beyond irrational and rational devotion. And the secrecy, we talked about secrecy because the Vajrayana teaching is so precious. We, we can discuss this if it is not uh, clear enough for you because I think Mm. There is, there seems to be little misunderstanding about the Vajrayana secrecy. Yeah, so I will give you a scenario here. You are a new student. And, okay, you have kind of a rational, you know, you have a rational devotion. You, you are searching, you are critical. Then you go to a center or a, some sort of a temple where you heard there is a guru. And now you have heard that you must analyze the guru. If not 12 years, at least 12 months. Then in the process of trying to analyze the guru, his surroundings and his whatever bodyguards all keeps you away from him. And um, 
So you find there is no way to understand the guru that you want to, you know, you want to analyze, you know, I mean, you don't even get close to the guru, so how do, how do you analyze? You can try your best, but if it is not working, then this most likely, this is not your guru. Or the karmic connection, the karmic connection to this guru is not ripening. No, this is very complicated, you know. It's like, you know, when Milarepa first went to this Dzogchen master, who gave him all the Dzogchen teachings right away, nothing happened, remember? And, and this master said, okay, you are not, you know, you and I, we don't click. You should go to, you know, South Tibet, where there is a master called Marpa. Immediately he had goosebumps, even hearing it. So in this case, the karma connection to the, this particular master is strong. So sometimes you are feeling can really take over. No, so this is very, it's very, very complicated. I have met many students, even in the West, of different teachers, not only here, who just felt to this person that this is your, this is his or her guru. And many, and many of these people are very rational people, I would say. And I remember even telling them, are you sure? You better, you know, analyze a little bit. But they, you know, they wouldn't hear of this. They, you know, their feeling is so strong. And I have met people who has been student of this, these teachers for years and still practicing under this person. And I have met other people who are critical, always analyzing, very smart. 20 years they are still searching for the Guru. So this is very complicated. Um, again, I'm going everywhere, but I'm think I'm talking about if you using you know so I was giving you the scenario. Remember, you walk in, mm -hmm. and if you yeah if you find that that guru has too much, you know you can never find his or her quality because there's a too much secrecy, then he or she is not your guru. Don't stay there, don't spend, don't waste your time. Then, the element of surrender. Surrender is basically working with your ego. Because fundamentally, as a spiritual person, I mean, in Buddhism, you know, if you are a Buddhist, you, you know, your, your practice have to go against your ego. That's, that's must.
if this doesn't go, if your spiritual path does not go against your ego, then it's not even a spiritual path. It's just another spiritual materialism. So this actually leads to the next point, given the preeminence of science and secularization in the West, what place is there for spiritual tradition steeped in faith and ritual? Secularization is fine. Science is... Secularization is okay, science is okay, but if you are talking about the spiritual path according to Buddhism, it has to go against the ego. If you can accept that, then, oh, then every method Every, I don't know, tradition or ritual has a place for the modern society. Few years ago, I invited a Hindu priest in my house. You know, I like these Indian priests, you know, I like their music, and so I invited him to my house to do a fire puja. You know, you, ha you, know, you have to even negotiate with him, you know, like how much and all that. <laughs> and anyway, he came and, you know, he even have ra rates. How many date? How many deities? You know, like that. <laughs> so I I sponsored the puja and I was sitting there because I was I'm always so fascinated by their ritual. And then I asked him, so. T Tell me a little bit about fire puja. You know, this is an Indian priest, just, you know, anyone from the street. And we have, I have bought so many fire substances, you know, like flowers, incense, and the, you know, butter and all of that. He said, these are only outer substance. Inner substance is all the thoughts, he says. And the, these outer substance will be consumed by the outer fire. And the inner substance, the thoughts, is consumed by the wisdom. And then I said, how do you then lit this fi wisdom fire? <laughs> then he said, you need to read a lot of texts. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, e even though he was really a businessman, basically, <laughs> but I was very encouraged, even for him uh, have, have this much ability to talk <laughs> like that. You know, so if you can understand this, this kind of theory, or ritual, tradition, putting the palms together, prostrations, all this also have a place in this secularized scientific world 2018. Still have.
And also the Guru. And also the Guru. It, and Guru, really, Guru devotion is a journey. It is an adventure. You don't have to take. Yes, it is a very, if you think the consequence is a very scary. You, I will tell you, this, this I have to say, again, I'm talking too much here. But I have to say this. You know, Tibetans, Bhutanese, they all say, you know, many of my, my so-called my students, they just say, oh, he's my guru, it's just because he, my father's guru is, you know, him, or our village guru, you know, you understand, our, our town's guru. <coughs> That's not a good way. But with the Westerners, I have, I have noticed many times, people approach me, and they're so nervous, and they're so like, What they want is, can you be my guru? But they're really nervous. They're sweating their hand and all of this. And I, I have so much, you know, I really have so much, I don't know, joy and sympathy for this. It's, it's a scary thing. It's really giving your life into somebody's hand. And this is not to you. This is to all the gurus like myself and the future gurus and the young gurus. I want to say something. Just like all these people who come to come and say, can you be my guru with a sweat hand and, you know, fumbling and trembling. <laughs> I hope the future gurus and the present gurus, when they say yes, they should also fumble and sweat hand and, you know, be nervous. It's madness to have many, many, and try to have many disciples. It's madness. Yes, Sharvakayana, Mahayana level, fine. But Vajrayana, from both guru and the student, it's a madness. We just want to make a quick announcement about the snow before we do the questions. <laughs> just to say that um, the, the road down to Lodev is presently open. It's been plowed. The D902. But it's only for people who have chains or, or snow uh, tires, snow uh, socks. And the, the fire brigade recommends that if you do urgently need to go down, that you go before 5.30, so now. So we would recommend that if, if at all um, possible, it's the safer option to stay here. And there is accommodation, and after the teaching, we'll let you know how you can be accommodated. But if there's anyone who urgently needs to go to Lodev, and actually the road to Montpellier is also closed, so only Lodev, then, then you, you would need to go now, and we have some people who could help you in the parking lot. So just if there's anyone who urgently needs to go, 
Maybe we can just see a show of hands. So once again, we're really not recommending this. Not tires, you have to have chains or snow socks. Okay. And then everyone else we can we can stay on. And those who show their hand, should they move somewhere? Yeah. It's just, just for us to know for, for people helping them at the parking lot. So once again, only the road to Lodev is open and not recommended to travel unless you absolutely have to and not after 5.30. Okay, so shall we continue? So for first question, for all the people who somewhat lost their faith in the Lama, or who are unable to see him as the Buddha anymore, without bad intentions, people who keep quiet about this issue, what is happening to their spiritual path? As the Vajrayana path is all about the Lama, what will happen when they die? This is a very good question because it's talking about karma, karmic consequences. Really, especially the Guru, you know, more than the scandal, more than public shaming or whatever, if Guru doesn't know what he is doing and if he is doing this selfishly, he or she is not above the law of karma. He or she will go through the karmic consequences. And there is a, the other element of the question, what will happen to those who keep it secret? I think something like that, is it? These are people who, who keep quiet about, they don't make a fuss about who are un, or have lost their faith. That, that, I have, that I cannot judge because I don't know what is the motivation of their keeping it quiet. If their motivation of keeping it quiet is out of very negative, vicious, it's not good. If their motivation is to, you know, keep it calm, try to really not spark more fire as much as, you know, possible, 
then maybe it's good. And maybe their motiv they, they don't even have a motivation. They themselves are stunned and, you know, like, don't know what to think, what to do, what is right, what is wrong. This so, I think it's very difficult to judge. And it's better not judge from my side. Okay. Is it possible for a lama to say sorry to his or her disciples? Yes, definitely. A lama can say sorry. In general, lama can say sorry. Lama should say sorry. But that is a big generalization. If the Lama knows what he is doing, he or she is doing, then he or she should know whether this needs apology or not. This I cannot judge. And it's very, very del it's very complicated also. It's a bit like mother and the child. I know, I have seen also parents, you know, sort of disciplining the children and the child and then immediately apologizing. Probably it's a good thing. But probably it's also sending mixed signals. So these are very complicated. Ap apology, again, is, uh, what do you call it, privilege of samsara, this zone. If you want to have it, again, then, you know, fully dedicated tantric practitioner may be a little bit difficult. But here again, I must emphasize, the guru, whoever is uh, holding this position of guru, he or she must know where they are. If they are still a samsaric being, not only they apologize, they better, you know, correct this spiritually. They better do confessions, they have a lot of, they have more work than the student. They not only, they, sh they should not only apologize to the student, they should apologize to their guru lineage and the devas and the dakas and especially the dakinis. Dakinis are the possessor of the Tantrayana. Dakinis are the possessor, possessor, you know, so the owner of the Tantrayana. Dak Dakinis, Dakinis see 
the students as their subject, their sort of beloved subject. Anyone who mishandled them, abused them, misused them, is not in the good book of the Dakinis. This is from the, and again, tantric texts I'm reciting. I think, <coughs> you know, as I was saying, ideally these things should be kept secret. If, since it's all there, I mean, sort of, you know, Vajrayana is now being talked in the public, I think it's also, if since it's talked, it's better to talk completely, sort of, then otherwise this partial sort of information is confusing people, like guru devotion. There's only one part. As I was saying, where is the student devotion? People are not talking about it. Samaya to the guru. Samaya to student. Equally important. Actually, sometimes even more important. Yes, I remember. It's much more grave for the for, for the for the teacher who takes the position of the guru. Sometimes ten folds, sometimes hundred folds. I never got any empowerment from Sogyur Rinpoche. In the new way of running Rigpa spiritually, who will give the empowerments? Okay, now here also, just no, you know, these few months I've been sort of doing a little bit of reading and Rigpa and all of the just. A, the, just a glimpse that I know. Uh, empowerment. I think there seems to be a little bit of a misunderstanding here. Those who have received the Mahasandhi teachings, you have received the Abhisheka. Mahasandhi, like a three words of Garab Dorji, is the fourth Abhisheka. It's the final initiation. You have received it. I think many times people think that empowerment is something to do with the vase and something to drink and eat and put something. That's the more sort of ground level, <coughs> sort of more common level. Mahasandhi teaching is the highest initiation. So if you have received this, you have received the initiation. And this is what I have, you know, I have made it very clear. And this is what I have also written and have been saying, and this is where I feel that Sogyal Rinpoche have also not done good job in preparing, explaining. But at the same time, I've also encountered those who claim that they didn't know. I have been told that many of these people have been sitting through many teachings, not only from Sogyal Rinpoche, but also from many other teachers, and many other teachers their teaching includes extensive explanation of that. So, you know, just because your body is sitting in the teaching does not necessarily mean you have also listened or heard. Mm -hmm. 
à ce sujet que je me, que je me dis, comme je l'ai écrit d'ailleurs, et j'en ai parlé auparavant, que peut-être que cette organisation n'a pas fait suffisamment de préparation, n'a pas suffisamment expliqué, et c'est bien cela, peut-être qu'elle n'a pas fait un, un, un bon travail. Mais aussi, je dois dire que j'ai rencontré des gens qui prétendent ne pas savoir, alors qu'on me dit par ailleurs que ces gens-là ont assisté à des transmissions de pouvoir, à des enseignements, avec bien d'autres mains, qui, eux, donnent des explications très longues et très détaillées. Donc, ce n'est pas seulement l'administration, ce n'est pas seulement le fait que le corps soit aussi compétent, il faut aussi écouter et entendre. I'm itching to tell you this. Ah, ça me de parler. Okay, this is my imaginary, not just for Rick, but any other, you know, that, you know, sort of, how to do this in the West. Vajrayana. Okay, so you are somewhere in, I don't know, Maksai. Maksai? Maksai. And, I don't know, somebody walk into your house and he wants to follow the path. Then, you know, I think something like this would be good. Okay, you, go and count. 108 cracks. Cracks, you know, like cracks. Cracks. Each, you know, new cracks. Every day, 108 cracks. That's your first practice. Nothing else, just that. Then maybe after about a month, tell yourself five times a day, you are going to die. You understand? Stuff like this, you lead. And then you can do all this, you know, sitting on the cushion and, you know, breathing, all this mindfulness business, you can do that. Okay. Mm. Then maybe something like a four noble truths. And even four noble truths. I don't think we should talk about the suffering first. <coughs> Because, you know, if you are running a business school, <laughs> you need to talk about the profit first, no? <laughs> Who wants to talk about the, you know, like loss? <laughs> so I think maybe, you know, something like a, you know, the, the noble truth of the cessation of the su suffering, we can talk about this. So maybe two years or three years of that. And then one day you said, okay, now you should wear a tuxedo or something like this, you know, like maybe a uh, you know, uh, nice dress or something like that. Let open a bottle of champagne and, you know, let's go, you know, let's make a big deal. And then some sort of a ceremony of knighting you as the warrior who will save the world. <laughs> so corresponding that, you know, those all the, you know, sort of paramitas and all those, you know, yeah. So maybe after eight, nine, ten years, then you begin to say, you know what, I really have something to tell you. <laughs> I really make the student really wants to hear this. <laughs> really, so you know, this, if you hear this, you will be so good. You know, like, but you don't really say it. <laughs> Maybe about a year or two, you really make the student want to hear, <laughs> what is it? And then again, one more 
more, you know, festive, you know, you create a, I don't know, festive mood. <laughs> and then your student comes with all the, you know, right outfit, I don't know, all the atmosphere, music. Mm. Then all you say is, you are perfect as you are. That's it. Like that. You understand? I think something like this. Can you explain the concept of crazy wisdom? <laughs> I think, I have a feeling that this was translated by Chagim Trungpa Rinpoche, right? Yeah. Mm. I think we already did a little bit. It's really based on all your spiritual path must go against your ego. In other words, as soon as you find a little bit comfortable with a certain rug, you pull, you ask somebody to pull that rug out of your feet. By the way, even in the Mahayana, there is a story, Atisha Dipamkara, when he went to Tibet, he actually brought a, an Indian guy who does nothing <laughs> but to annoy him. <laughs> that That was his job, to annoy him, so that he can practice patience. <coughs> well, I'm just giving you this as an example. The, I'm just giving you an idea of what, crazy wisdom. Crazy, what is crazy? I guess it's something not normal, isn't it? Not normal. So this is what I was going on about. Do you want to be normal? Yeah, then just download those apps, mindfulness apps. Go to any of these mindfulness weekend course. Much better. I have it. I have it. Yeah, several of them. They're all good. They're very good, very nicely packaged. So good, it's just so good. They're, you know, just, in, what do you call it, interreact? Yeah. So good. <laughs> they even sort of have a reminder. <laughs> okay, it's a time to meditate, like that. <laughs> then you should do that. But if you want to, if you have the, if you really want to be a little bit not normal, or not only a little bit, really not normal, I mean, go out of that. And by the way, you have the tradition. I mean, even in the Picasso, isn't he French? Picasso? Spanish? Spanish? Oh, sorry. Okay. Didn't he sort of, after a while, he sort of went beyond the normal way of drawing and painting, isn't it? See, I have no merit to understand him. Some paintings of the later, you know, work of Picasso is just useless. I saw, a he you know, this, uh, what do you call it, the bicycle, <laughs> broken bicycle, you know, the handle. This is supposedly Picasso art. There's a little bit of a crazy wisdom there. I think, you know, example I'm giving you. So, 
Yeah, please don't understand crazy wisdom is some sort of a license to, you know, sort of beat up people and do crazy things as in, you know, the what you are thinking. Crazy, you know, it's going against the, I think you are, you know, you know, the normal zone. Really? Bottom line is this. Bottom line is how much you want to make your life, this life, comfortable. If that is very important, you are not a spiritual person. To make your life comfortable, you have a vacuum machine. washing machine and then you have a mindfulness <laughs> and uh, you know Buddhism you know it's a very nice vegetarian strictly speaking you are not really a spiritual person You will die as how many of the people who suffer with existentialist angst die. <coughs> Sogi Rinpoche was the personification of devotion for his teachers. He sponsored many monasteries in Nepal and in Bhutan, to practice for his long life. How come he was not protected from these catastrophes? Could you please speak about the power of devotion and prayer? Well, again, I'm not trying to be smart here. But how do we know? He's not. Maybe this is a protection. You know, if only you can fast forward this. And let us look after 25 years. And then you try to see something. And please mark my word. We never know. Rimshe, could you suggest a test or two that a disciple might apply to a prospective teacher to verify their authenticity? This I can do. <laughs> okay, traditionally, of course, you need to see whether he's learned in three yanas, for instance. Okay. We are not, here we are now talking about before taking him as your guru. Huh? And then you should also know, you should also see how much he's talking and living with what he's talking. You know, people can talk very nicely, but they not they don't they may not li live with what they are talking. You understand? Know, talking, walk the talk, right? Isn't that the? Yeah. 
This is why it's always a little bit puzzling. You know, many of these sort of critics, those who are critical towards this guru and the Vajrayana, you know, guru-student relationship, many of them, they write books. They have their own teaching going on. They have their own follower going on. It's kind of puzzling for me. They should not, uh, you know, ruin their own trade. Trade, trade. They should, they, they should protect this trade. I'm being sarcastic, by the way. Okay, most important, I'm still on the classic examination exam. How much is your guru trusting the Buddha, Dharma, and the Sangha? And even more important, how much is this guru trusting the karma? That's so important. Oh, this is a very, very important one. No guru is above the law of karma. If he is a Mahasiddha, you know, enlightened being, of course. But now, how do we, you know, still on a more practical level, how do we analyze? Everything what I've said before, and then be consciously go against a lot of his wish and see what happens. And just as he's sort of, you know, like keeping distant from you, try to go close again and hook his mind. And then check how much is he falling into that trap. Just as he's going into your world and falling into your trap, again, I don't know, pinch bottom of his girlfriend or her, her boyfriend or whatever. And then see how much jealousy he has. And um, yes, raise your voice. I mean, be critical, openly, in letter, everything. If your guru cares for you, and if he has seen some potential in you, he will not give up. He or she will not give up. This is important, please. Everybody should not know this. Those, especially those who are those who have not taken the guru yet, but those who wants to, they should do this. But always, since you are analyzing, always have watching the watcher. Don't get entangled with your game also. Then, then you are already ruined. <laughs> Have it with, a, you know, this attitude of you are, uh, you are analyzing. And it's a lot of fun, I, I tell you. A little bit scary too, of course. And you will always be afraid that you, that you will you may get rejected. Don't be afraid. If you are meeting with a really compassionate master, chances of you getting rejected is zero. <laughs> he 
he or she is supposedly bodhisattva, how can he reject you? This is what I was talking about. You know, remember earlier I was, you know, Thal Thalia, the democratically, democratically elected guru. Mm -hmm. Whoa, there you have a problem. I mean, I, I actually want to have this kind of uh, system because then I can quit as a guru, <laughs> or I can resign, or I can get fired. That would be actually much easier for some of the gurus who really don't want to be a guru. But if he or she is a genuine guru, they will also always look at you and see how much you are really following him just for an attention or some sort of a worldly sort of attention or how much you are really looking for enlightenment. So have that in your mind. You know, your wish to be enlightened is the most important. Don't ever go close to somebody, anyone, let alone a guru, with a wish to be, wish to have attention or whatever. You, you know, you are, you are asking for trouble. And one day you might get attention, you get so high. Next day, your guru must be having a flu, so he may appear to be not paying attention to you, get so depressed. Next day, still no attention, then you get really angry, and then you write different things in the, in the social media. So, all this we need to think. Okay. If we see all the acts of the teacher as skillful means, then we are blind. And if we find fault with the teacher, we are samaya corruptors. So it seems we're damned either way. <laughs> Yes, from the normal point of view, you are damned. In the normal zone. But if you are in the... Okay, I will use the very... Okay. Here I need to tell you this. And this, by the way, comes from the Mahasandhi language. Tave zong du shuk. Gombe chang du do. Gombe chang ni dol. Jebe mok dun. This is the classic word. <coughs> Firmly enter in the castle of view. Shunyata, you know? That's castle. You know, when you are in the castle of the view, protected, then you are confident. No arrow flying from the behind. You can relax. So enter into the view of Shunyata. And the second one, oh, so precious. Go beyond Treacherous journey of meditation. This is another unique Vajrayana expression. Do you know while everybody is celebrating, 
while everybody is celebrating busy you know trying to do mindfulness do you know what is the outlook from the vajrayana towards meditation treacherous journey you know what is meditation meditation is just just imagine a, some sort of a edge abyss on both side and this edge very thin edge is also a lot of soap <laughs> and you are wearing high heel shoes <laughs> and they have some railings that is all made of uh, lego that stick with a magnet <laughs> That's how Vajrayana sees all meditations are. You have no choice, you have to go. But you, your attitude should be, that's how the meditation is. See, I told you, Vajrayana is, Vajrayana is made for you guys, really. It's really, really avant-garde, like French. It's really, everybody is still old-fashioned, oh, let's meditate and be mindful. <laughs> this is how the Vajrayana talks. And just to finish this one, the third one, Chepin Bogdan, now this is a little bit, Bogdan is like, um, is to, crank it up i guess it's like if you are making a wine i think wine or a beer and if it's not really working you put something like a ferment and then it then works you know so to really crank it crank your path up boost it reboot sort of <laughs> You have to apply action. Different kinds of action. Depending on what kind of path dweller you are. <coughs> if you are a beginner, then your action should be gentle, begging bowl, shaved head, vegetarian, sitting straight, smile, contribute a little bit here and there for these things like animal rights, <laughs> and say nice things whenever there's a candle vigil of all sorts of things happening, you know, participate. That's what you should do. Now, if you, you know, we are talking about crazy wisdom here, right? If you are getting better and better, then this sort of behaving nice, you have to transcend. Then you have to, well, in the classic word, hung hung, pepe, meaning you have to also then, you know, your action should be kind of volatile and really, really, you know, something is not only someone else pulling the rug out of your feet, you yourself putting or uh, taking out the rug constantly that kind of action need to be applied that's it's too it's very dramatic <coughs> what was the question i forgot <laughs> This was the one about being damned either way. Oh yes. So, if if you want to be in that zone of the Vajrayana practitioner, being damned for uh, being uh, what do you call it? Idiot, uh, having uh, what? A pure perception, right? Being blind. Being blind and what? Being and, and the other one being 
finding faults, so being samurai, samurai corruptors. Yeah. You should take it as a blessing. This is a Vajrayana. Okay. When a student is not properly initiated into Vajrayana and the teacher uses methods that are ordinarily unethical, are these actions then wrong? Very wrong. <coughs> yeah. Remember the question says not properly prepared? Very wrong, very wrong, very wrong. Three times, please. Okay. Based on what you said about Samaya not being properly established, so in your letter, what do students need to do to either rectify this or to remove themselves? To what? To, if what you said, if the Samaya connection between the teacher and the student is not properly established, then what do students need to do to either rectify this or to remove themselves? <laughs> If you don't have the Samaya yet, I, you know, especially if you are a beginner, I will advise you don't rush into get having one. Prepare yourself. If you if you have the aspiration to practice the Vajrayana, prepare yourself through hearing and contemplation of Sharvakayana and the Mahayana. If you already have, then, and you want to continue, then there are so many ways to restore this. Vajrayana method is incredible. Don't dwell on only the bad things. I think we are talking so many things about bad, bad, you know, like breakage of Samayas. Let's talk about a restoration of the Samaya. You know, restoring the Samaya is way much easier than breaking the Samaya. I'm serious. Do you know why? It's a very simple reason. To make this permanently dirty is difficult. <laughs> but to, to wash, no matter how dirty it looks, very easy. Why? Because the cup is primordially pure. So good news is on our side. Just chant Vajrasattva mantra once, that will alone do. This is what Vajrasattva said. Why is there so much emphasis on a destructive approach of crushing ego in Vajrayana? Is this a crucial part? There seem to be more effective, safer ways. Actually, really destructive and really, really mean method exists in the Sharvakayana level. At 
the least in the Vajrayana you can rise as a deity. <coughs> well, I have already mentioned enough. If you want to be a spiritual person, according to, according to the Buddhist <coughs> interpretation, by the way, the path has to go against your ego. Okay. How much can you go against ego? 100 degree? 10 degree? I mean, that's, you know, you should, you know, you should, you should uh, know this. You can start with like one degree going against. <laughs> but, you know, I have to be honest, you know. Buddha Dharma eventually is aiming to go against 100%. But maybe the question, the one who, whoever is asking this question about the ego, I don't know, the identity of the ego is where we are mis in, mis you know, crisscrossing here. Because we, we don't talk about crushing the confidence. We are talking about crushing the ego. And by the way, there is no ego to crush. <laughs> so, you know, don't be too panic. <coughs> and it's not so wise for you to think that there is an ego, because that's a delusion. More of that, please read Chandrakirti's uh, but, uh, Madhyamika Avatara. What is a proper initiation to Vajrayana? Can we reconcile what you are saying and what the Dalai Lama and others have said and in that what you said applies after the full initiation and what the Dalai Lama said applies before full initiation. This question has been asked many times, but this particular question, I would, this is, a, I, I, I like this, ask, this question. Because n as I've been saying repeatedly again and again, you have to analyze the path and the teacher again and again. This is written in the Tantric text. If you can still criticize and analyze the Guru after receiving the initiation, what's the point of analyzing 12 years, you know, before? What's the point? Might as well just do it, you know, receive the initiation, because you can still criticize, you can still analyze. What's the point of analyzing then? So yes, I, th I also will encourage you to analyze the Guru. And more than Guru, teaching. Really, I really, with my folded hand, I will request people to analyze Vajrayana. More likely, you are suited for apps. <laughs> I have a feeling, really, you are more connected to these apps. Easy, just one dollar ninety nine. Some are free. 
And they're very nice, you know? <laughs> very, really beautiful. <sighs> Forget Vajrayana, even Mahayana. <laughs> it's difficult. Compassion to sentient being, even one sentient being. I was saying earlier, right? No, earlier. It's exactly the same. Guru devotion. Okay, let's say you can't do it. Let's say we can do Mahayana practice. What's the quintessence of the Mahayana practice? Compassion to sentient being. Compassion to, of course, all sentient beings, but even if you can't do to all, one sentient being, you have to do it, it unconditionally. You can't say, well, I will have a compassion only if you behave. This is the path you choose. I want to practice Mahayana Dharma. I want to choose the path practicing compassion to sentient being. One being, let's say. Let's say Donald Trump. You have to practice compassion no matter what he does. Even when he does the strangest things like to, con to control more killing, you give more guns. <laughs> what do you have to do when he does that? How do you react to your own kid when your kid does something strange? Oh, darling, not like that, you know? That's how we have to do to Donald Trump, too. You can't be, you know? It's, it's really the same. Guru devotion, <laughs> you know, one person, guru devotion, pure perception. Compassion to one sentient being. <laughs> Forget all sentient being. But that's your choice. You know, from the app to the Ati Yoga, you have a choice. <laughs> so, I think, yeah, we conclude. So, I, you know, it's of course not finished. We need to discuss these things again and again. And even though I was quoting many different people and trying to, you know, sometimes, you know, making jokes, I really appreciate, like uh, Thalia and many other who raise these questions. We need to appreciate because these are doubts and analysis that are necessary. Um, under no circumstance we should try to change the Vajrayana core teachings. We should not do that. Because if you do that, that is not an act of compassion. That, that's an act of selfishness. If the, you know, change the, you know, thing just so that it will suit people's need, you know, I don't know, wants and desire, it will ruin the teaching. But, as I said, 
less than about a hundred years that Buddha Dharma is, you know, growing in the West. We need to be patient. But also, we need to be, uh, what do you, they, we need to also be cautious of not getting diluted. Okay, I'm teaching you how to teach, uh, how to make sushi. You know, I can teach you how to make sushi, you know, like the proper way. Or I can eat a sushi and open my intestine and take out this sushi and give it to you. You cannot really argue saying that's not sushi. <laughs> it is a sushi, but it's a little different. <laughs> I'm afraid that many times this seems to be what's happening. The sushi teaching is slowly dying because people are giving this sushi coming from the stomach. We need to worry about these things. Who is the famous musician? Bizet? Okay. You are French, right? You. Bizet. Bizet. You know, music composer? Bizet. 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 Beautiful music. What? Yeah, I can also put, you know, waterfall sound, birds chirping, rain falling, thunderstorm, and then slowly, slowly forget the real visit. I think the French not, is not going to like this, right? And then, after 100 years, you learn the French bizet from California with all the rainfall sound. <laughs> Would the French tolerate if a Philharmonic, Paris Philharmonic Orchestra or whatever, played this Californian, you know, like birds chirping and water falling bizet? So, I, you know, this is what I say. I'm a traditionalist. I want to keep the visit. And I, I don't object you put, uh, you know, birds and, uh, you know, waterfall. It's okay. But, you know, real visit should also be alive. So with this, I'm going to conclude. I'm, um, I hope this has given you some sort of a food for thoughts. Okay, thank you. Rinpoche, on behalf of everyone, I'd just like to thank you so much um, for your very provocative and challenging talk. And I think it's clear, you know, that just the way you approach these issues, you have effectively opened, you know, a forum for discussion amongst us all. And not only in Rigpa, because I know you'd like us to continue this sort of discussion in Rigpa. But since this is going to go on YouTube, maybe a much more intelligent and, and better discussion on Vajrayana issues more, more widely too. So let's hope this really does contribute something really significant in terms of uh, understanding Vajrayana in the, in the West.
And just like we obviously need to go over your teachings again and again to, to sort of um, really think through all the points you've made, we would request that you also come back and continue this discussion with us and don't leave it there. <laughs>